Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our Sunday morning service. Uh, be blessed, I pray, and uh, as we join together in worshipping our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who lives in heaven with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and as we hear his words spoken to us and expounded to us here this morning. I want to begin uh, from Habakkuk 3 and uh, verse 2. Lord, I have heard of your fame, and I stand in awe of your deeds. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In our time, make them known, and in wrath, remember to show compassion. Amen. So let's pray. Father, may we not turn aside from following our Lord Jesus Christ. But may we serve him with all of our hearts. May we not turn aside to go after worthless things, which do not profit or deliver, which have no enduring worth. All of the works of the flesh are evident, all kinds of wickedness, not least of which is lawlessness and hostility toward the things of God. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against all these things there is no law. They show forth the fruit of an everlasting life. So let us remember your works, Lord, your works of years gone by, your works of today, and your works which you have foretold will come to pass. Let us meditate on these things and consider all your mighty deeds. Father, you are holy, so may we be holy also. You have revealed your strength among your people. You have redeemed them with power. You have commissioned your church. Blessed be your name. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And so here's Ben this morning uh, with the reading. Thank you, Chris, and good morning, church. It's uh, my pleasure to bring the Word of God to you again this morning. This morning I'll be reading from Matthew 14, 1 to 21. That time Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus, and he said to his attendant, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, Is it not lawful for you to have her? Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people because they considered him John a prophet. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guests and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed, but because of his oath and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted, and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl. He carried it to her mother, John, John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve baskets 
of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men beside women and children. This is the word of the Lord. Now I'd like to ask Johnson to come and share his message with you today. Thanks, Johnson. Good morning, church. I just want to welcome you all for coming to online church service. Uh, may God bless you. May God help you as you are listening to the word of God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, your heart went out to the crowd when you saw their need. We bring to you this morning our hunger, our longing for healing, our yearning to understand the scriptures and to hear you speak to us. Meet us in this place, Father. Meet us in this place. Embrace us. Receive our praise and the best of all we can offer. Strengthen us individually and together that we might reflect your compassion, reaching out to those places and those people who are hating, sad, lonely. We pray in your precious name. Amen. I just want to thank you for the reading of the Word of God, which um, we have yet. This morning is Jesus grieves John the Baptist. Jesus grieves John the Baptist. Shiva or Sheva is the Jewish custom of mourning. From ancient times, families sat together to mourn those who passed on. Shiva, which really means seven in Hebrew, is the week-long mourning period in Judaism for a first-degree relative, parent, sibling, spouse, or child. So the ritual is called sitting Shiva, and is began immediately following the funeral of the deceased relative. It's clear that Jesus' disciples understood their responsibilities in these customs, and yet Jesus, while honoring the dead in grief, defies these customs, even while defying death itself. Jesus knows that it is not the custom that defies, that defines mourning, but the way one uses grief to honor the dead. We see this already in Matthew 8, verse 22 when one of his disciples feels compelled to sit Shiva for his father. Jesus instructs him to leave the dead, bury the dead, and instead to remain on their mission to fulfill God's plan and save the world of the living. Now, in our scripture for today, in Matthew 14, we see Jesus wrecked with grief over John's death, as most likely one of John's closest relatives, cousin, Jesus might have taken part in a minion in order to sit Shiva after John's death. But John had been beheaded by Herod, and it's not clear if his body had been released to his relatives. Would Jesus have taken part? We don't know. All we know is that Jesus has received the news of John's murder, and stricken with worry, pain, and grief, Jesus withdrew in a boat to a deserted place to be by himself for a while, to mourn and to pray. So yet when others, whether followers, admirers, or concerned people who know him, hear of what has happened, they have compassion for him and they follow him. They will not leave him alone in his grief. And like an unconventional family, they sit with him in his pain. Some may have followed him simply because he fascinated them, Others may have sought his healing power. Still others may only have wanted to be around him. But Matthew seems to indicate that this was no ordinary teaching moment. In fact, not one of the four scriptures mentioned Jesus teaching at all, which would have been disallowed during a mourning period. But the people simply to sit with him, to be with him, to be present for him in his grief. So Matthew is the only one of the four Gospels that mention Jesus, John's death as the incentive for Jesus to seek solace in a remote place. Mark says this inner circle went with him. Luke says they, were, they went near Bethsaida, and John tells it happened just before the Passover. All of these details are important in their own way. 
But only Matthew, Dr. and friend, mentions Jesus' grief. Yet, this important detail gives us emotional insight, not only Jesus' motives, but Jesus' humanity, his spirit, his understanding of customs, his devotion to God's mission, and his servant heart. So from out of the, his grief, Jesus had compassion on the living, the ailing, the sick, and the mortal. And he spent this morning, his morning period, healing the sick and life, and dying. So when even arrived, he fed them a kind of shiva meal, a miracle meal, a salute to life meal of fish and bread. So in doing this, he honored John in the best way he could imagine, by serving and healing and feeding others. For this is the true essence of the Jewish shiva. Not the tradition itself, but the idea that to honor the dead, we honor the sacredness of life, the miracle of healing, the life giving sustenance of food, the gift of community. Jesus did not allow grief to consume him or create death within him. But he, he ministered out of his grief and created new life and hope from out of the finality of death. So the healing of Jesus performed that day, the meal he saved, the miracles he wrote, the 12 baskets of leftovers that signified the hope of all people. These would be the symbols of John's legacy. For what John had begun, Jesus would finish. In the Jewish Shiva tradition, the Satyaga is custom of giving to the poor in order to honor the dead. It is part of the duty of the next of kin, the relatives of the dead. While friends and community feel it their great misfa, sacred and compassionate duty to come to support and comfort the bereaved in their grief. It is a host misfa to offer an honorary meal, Satan. So although conventional, although outdoors by the sea, Jesus thought of the feeding of the 5,000 men plus women and children, probably about 8,000 8, people. Testify to the amazing community surrounding him at that time, those who called him friend or teacher, those who sought his healing, and those who looked to him as a man of God. In his time of need, that community surrounded him with presence and grace. In sharp contrast, what would happen later as John grieved in the Garden of Gethsemane. And in return, Jesus would feed them, heal them, and offer life in the face of death. So for Jesus, this was the best and most heartfelt way that he could honor John John's ministry and everything he stood for. So today, we in our culture are experiencing our own time of grieving. Some may have lost direct relatives and friends to COVID-19 or other maladies or diseases. Others may simply be experiencing the mass grief, sadness, and disillusionment of our current world situation in which our mortality and fear of it has become a daily reminder. People are suffering because of lack of food, because of this COVID. People are in lockdown, there is no work, there is nothing they are doing. And millions of people are facing death. Collective grief can be a debilitating element for community and world. It can result in depression, suicide, anger, uprisings and hopelessness, illness and destructive and disinterest. Yet to uprises from understanding that to save with compassion both honors and heals grief. So Jesus healed himself, even as he healed the crowd before him. He fed his own emotional needs, even as he fed those around him on that hillside. He served his wounded soul, even as he saved the world with compassion and mercy. We minister to our own hearts, even as we minister to other people. Jesus, we call him the suffering servant. But in this particular scripture today, we can truly see that what that means. For Jesus knew that life always conquers death. That whether we suffer from sadness, grief, illness, or conflict, the answer lies in mercy, love, compassion, and service. When we love the world, we come to save the world. When we save the world, we come to love the world. And that is what Jesus is teaching to his disciples. Later, Jesus would grieve again before his agonizing death. But this time, everyone would desert him and is still on the cross in suffering and pain. Jesus would save the world and save all of us. 
Jesus is the life, the way, the truth. Follow him. Save the world and you too will be saved. So we need people who stand up and save the world. Even in time of sadness. Even in time of death. I've seen that there are people who are always on the forefront. Even in time of uncertainties, we need to applaud those people and say, please carry on because God has called us to save others. May the good Lord continue to bless you. May he continue to enrich you. May he continue to help you and support you and protect you from all the things you think they can harm you. God is always there with you. God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so good morning everyone again as we come together to take Holy Communion as the people of God. And this is of course, right at the beginning, is the perfect time for uh, us to, uh, to pause this video and uh, for you to go and collect the communion elements that uh, you want to bring together in your own homes. And we're going to meet back here again shortly uh, once you get all that together and uh, you unpause the video again. So I'm going to give you a brief moment of time to go and collect all of those and I'll meet you back here shortly. So let me begin our time together reflecting on a couple of things before we share this meal together. I want to uh, begin by reading the passage of scripture from Mark 14 and verses 22 to 26. Mark 14, 22 to 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So I want to reflect on this, on the latter portion of these particular verses where Jesus said that he would not drink again of the fruit of the vine until he would drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know whether you've thought about it like this, but this is really an amazing prophetic passage. Jesus is, in doing this, he is declaring the future kingdom of God, that the future kingdom of God is coming. Moreover, he is also declaring that he will one day return. And when he does return and he's setting up that kingdom, then and only then will he drink again from the fruit of the vine. So the Last Supper then, I don't know if you've thought about this before, but the Last Supper in many ways is a, a prophetic type. In remembering what Jesus did for us in the past, we are also looking forwards to the future banquet in the fullness of the Kingdom of God. The, and in fact, the wedding supper of the Lamb when he comes to set up the Kingdom of God on this earth. And so I want us to think about this because there are some very powerful elements in the way the Last Supper was actually instituted by Jesus and what it points to, to and uh, the future prophetic fulfillment of uh, the Kingdom of God. And uh, there are some amazing uh, things about all of this, which I hope to bring out maybe in the future in maybe a message if Johnson allows me to do that, because it's just fascinating the connections between the Galilean wedding and the Last Supper as instituted by Jesus Christ. So what an amazing picture, really. Something bigger, something that has really only come to light with recent research around how Galilean weddings were performed, which actually leads us to a much bigger and uh, profound um, appreciation of what the Last Supper was all about. So. It gives us incredible hope. It gives us an expectation 
really of a glorious future with Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God. And so this picture should encourage us and it should cause us to pray uh, in grateful thanks. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we pause now before this table, ready to take these elements, Father, we, we uh, begin to, to realize that there is something incredibly profound about this meal that we take, this sharing of the common cup, the sharing of the bread together, what they mean, what they symbolize. But more than that, the words that Jesus spoke show us a much bigger meaning that is not necessarily just about the past, but it is also looking forward to a glorious future. And Lord, as, as believers in Jesus Christ, we hope, we have the expectation of, the, the joy in, in remembering that there is a future ahead of us in the kingdom of God with Jesus. And it is upon that occasion when he joins us together, when we all come together as the saints of the kingdom, that we will have opportunity to rejoice and to share the, the cup with Jesus in that fulfilled kingdom. So we thank you for the blessing. We thank you for what it pictures. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are here together this morning. As our Lord showed us, we come to this particular table and we share this sacred meal together as the people of God. We partake in the simple elements of the bread and of the fruit of the vine. And we remember Jesus and his divine work for our benefit. So the bread we break is a sharing in the body of Jesus Christ. And the cup we take is a sharing in the blood of Jesus Christ. Together, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. And so I invite you now to receive this holy sacrament of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ and to do so with thanksgiving. The feast of the Lord is ready. And so please take a piece of bread and take some juice and in your own time consume these uh, and give thanks at the same time. And so we're going to pause the video now to give you time to go away, go ahead and do that, just that. And we're going to be back with you in just a few minutes. So we've taken the elements together, each of us in our own places, and uh, I want to conclude in prayer. We thank you, God, our Father, that through your word and through this sacrament that you have given us your Son, who is the true bread of heaven and the food of eternal life. And so strengthen us, Lord, we pray, in your service, that our daily living may show our thanks through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so, as we uh, normally do uh, on each Sunday that we take communion together, we are also going to we also take up two offerings: uh, our general purpose offering, and also we take an extra offering for our benevolent fund for those who are uh, need uh, extra assistance in their lives who are going through financial hardship. And so, I invite you now to gather together all of those uh, offerings, those gifts and to send them through the appropriate channels that we have published uh, previously. So let's pray now for the offering and give God thanks. Father in heaven, we are thankful. We are thankful that you invite us to participate in your kingdom work. What a joy it is to know that we are working for you, for you and for the blessing of others that we are bringing you glory that we are bringing you honor when we give our gifts when we give of our time when we give of our service to others lord we thank you for the privilege we thank you for the honor in being invited to do this with you 
So take the gifts, dear Lord, that everyone has uh, sent in and multiply them for the purposes of this word in this place. And may you receive all honour and glory now and forever. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, thank you all for joining us on this Sunday service and uh, bless you all. And I'm going to uh, hand you now back to Johnson who will bring us the concluding prayer and uh, the blessing, the benediction. Thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, forgive us, loving Lord, that we have strayed from your way. Forgive us for the times our lives have not been shaped by your truth. Forgive us for denying your life in us and in others by the way we have lived. In the name of Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, we pray. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. In Jesus' name, amen.